Hey y'all, in this video let's talk about structs in C-sharp. I feel like the concept of struct is a little bit mystified and today I wanted to explore that. So an average C-sharp dev may only be aware of structs as a counterpart to class that lives on the stack and not use them at all, which is fine until you need to optimize your code because there are some performance hits and then you need to add identify classes that should be refactored into structs. And this is tricky. There are no definitive guidelines on how to use that and how to apply the pattern. So in this video, I wanted to explore that, but I also wanted you to be aware of overusing structs. They are not meant to be used a lot in your code. They have a specific use case and they should be only used for optimization purposes mainly. So if you overuse uh, structs, you may actually be downgrading your performance without you even noticing. So in this video, let's explore when to use structs. Let's give you some guidelines on when to apply the class to struct refactoring. And also let's talk about some quirks with structs as well. So struct can be seen as an optimization purpose tool. When you see that a particular class in your application takes a lot of allocations and deallocations, so the GC pressure in your application starts to mount up, then you can Ideally, benchmark your application in the current state, apply the refactoring from class to structure, and then benchmark it again. If it helps, great, you made some progress, but it's not a fits all solution. So you cannot just blindly apply class to structs uh, refactoring and hope for the best. So let's talk about some other tips for applying that refactoring that might actually help you. Okay, so you've identified in your application the GC pressure problem. It is really high and you need to find some classes that should be refactored into structs. Well, first of all, look for classes that contain only other value types, where value types are just booleans, ints, longs, anything that cannot be nullable. Yeah? So if you have a class that is really simple, it is small, ideally less than 16 or 24 bytes. So for example, uh, it contains only four ints, then it is a potential candidate for the class to struct refactoring. The next big sign when to refactor from class to struct is when you are enumerating over a given type a lot in a collection. So you have a bunch of four statements or for each statements for that given type. Basically, classes live on the heap, they have different sizes and they are referenced by the pointer. So they can live in different parts of memory as opposed to structs which have fixed size so the compiler knows how many bytes it will take for that given structs to exist and also they will live next to each other so the compiler just needs to move the pointer by some predefined uh, size and then it will get the next value it is much it is much faster to retrieve uh, the struct this way than to go back see the next pointer and retrieve that part of memory so if you are enumerating over it a lot, then it is also a potential game to refactor from class to struct. But please be aware that your future struct can only contain other value types because if it contains even one reference type, it won't be able to calculate its size. It will be boxed onto the heap anyway. So yeah, keep that in mind as well. So the next point is a little bit tricky. So if you want to apply your refactoring from class to struct, you need to know that whenever you're passing your class into another method as an argument, it just needs to copy the pointer to it. As opposed to structs, which are copied by value. So the value copying is much more heavy on the memory and it will be slower. But if you, your struct is read only, as it should be, it will not be copied by value because the compiler knows that you won't be able to modify it in any way. So it is safe just to give you the original value. So this is something just to keep in mind whenever you would not use the read only struct, which by the way, you should use always as opposed to normal structs that could be modified. So the next two points are the constraints of the struct. So first of all, it is not guaranteed that the constructor of your struct will launch. So you have to be fine with it in the non-initialized state. So whenever you're working with ints, zero is also a valid int. The same goes for your structs. Any zeros that are there should be fine. And also your struct cannot be inherited from or inherit from anything as well. So, you know, structs should be small in concept, but also in memory, just keep it small. So now let's talk about the characteristics of struct. They should not be the deciding factor for choosing them, 
but you should keep them in mind. First point, we've already touched on it, you shouldn't rely on the constructor. It is not guaranteed to run. Next up, your structs should be immutable. So they should be always prefixed by the read only keyword. And the third point is that they are value types. So they are stored on the stack as long as you don't bring any reference types to them because then they also need to get some values from the heap so you don't gain anything. So that's the gist of it. Now let's jump into code and have a little bit of fun with them. So I created a simple struct here that violates any of the rules that I talked in the previous part of the video. So my struct is not read only, it has a constructor without any parameters and it also contains a value that is initialized here. Everything here is wrong and I'll show you how. So what does it mean to initialize the value here? It basically tells the compiler to remove this piece of code and inline the set here on every constructor that it is aware of. So in our scenario, it wouldn't make any difference because we set the age to the provided argument or the zero that we have here. But for the sake of it, let's just run the program. And what do you think that the age will be? Will it be zero? Will it be 45? Let's see. It is zero, but is it because of the assign here? Let's test it out but by setting the age to one by default. Well, it is still zero. How come? Well, the default value of person age does not launch the constructor. It just provides you the struct with every byte set as zero. So no matter what you want to do, your logic will not be called. So you need to be aware of the fact that constructors are a little bit tricky and providing a parameterless constructor is just pointless in structs. So why the age wasn't set to 45? Well, as I've said, it just basically it lines in it into the constructor. If we were to set the getter logic to return the 45 as the default when the age is set to zero, that would work but you have to be aware of the fact that your logic here is not guaranteed to run. Well then, how to ensure that your struct is in a correct state? Well, by making sure that setting everything to zero or the default value is a correct state in itself. So if we have our cannot vote property, if we know that the age is zero at the beginning, the cannot vote should be true, but it will be false. So we can maybe rename our boolean into can vote and now the default value of false works for us because the default age is zero and whenever we set our age we also can check if our age is equal or greater than 18 and now it all makes sense so let's say that we want to ensure that our age is greater than one because we live in korea or something well then we can create a backing field for our property and let's also make our struct read only so that is all correct. And now we cannot set our value. So let's say in it here and in it here. And now we want to ensure that our age will always be at least one. So if it is smaller than zero, let's return the one and otherwise let's return the age. And this should ensure that we will always return the correct value. Oh, we can also make this read only here and this is redundant now, so yep. And now we are making sure that whenever we retrieve any of our properties, it will be in the correct state. If you want to look at some more sophisticated example, look no further than date time. So if you have a date time, that will be just a default value of it. We can print out the date here. And as you can see, it is set to correct number of days. So it is not day zero, it is a day one. Because if you look into the logic in for day, it is a little bit complex, but as you can see, the gather is quite heavy and it will ensure that whenever you retrieve the day, it will not be the incorrect value of zero or negative. So you should protect your structs from invalid states on your gathers you cannot rely on your constructor. So do not throw any exceptions here because they are meaningless because anyone in your code just can create the default value with everything zeroed out. 
And with that, I think that is the end for the intro, the basic of Strax. I hope that you will now be more confident in using Strax and you'll also find the use cases for them, as well as maybe see the anti-patterns of the Strax that contain strings or other reference types and you'll refactor them immediately in your code. With that, I hope you enjoyed the video. Bye.